Welcome to the smartest doctor in the room. I'm your host, Dr. Dean Mitchell. Uh, I've never been comfortable with the term anti-aging. In fact, today it's a whole medical specialty. I don't think anybody is really capable of turning back your chronicle, chronological age, but I do believe there are secrets to maintaining your vitality as we age. And if you've never heard the term sarcopenia and only osteopenia and osteoporosis, I believe you will surely learn something very important on today's podcast. I, you know, I remember when I was a 25 year old medical resident doing internal medicine training, one of my uh, lectures was by a famous orthopedist at the hospital, Dr. William Hamilton. He worked on a lot of the ballet dancers and he was giving a lecture on back pain, but it was interesting because he opened the lecture quoting who I didn't know at the time, Betty Davis, the famous actress saying, getting old ain't for sissies. And, you know, again, I was 25 years old and I, was, I thought it was sort of a curious way to begin the lecture. And it didn't really mean a lot to me at 25 years old, but as I've aged, as I've taken care of patients that are elderly, I came to understand the meaning of that quote a lot better. Growing old can be painful, humbling, and at times a depressing experience, but maybe it doesn't have to be. I sometimes think about to the movie Cocoon, if uh, people remember that, where uh, somehow in the movie they figure out how people to stay vital, and, and you see the uh, some of the elderly geriatricians jumping cannonball style into a pool after they emerge from the cocoon. But life is not the movies. And my guest today, Dr. William Evans, has spent his career looking into how we can all remain vital as we age. His early work at Tufts University showed that even geriatric patients in their 80s can build muscles and cardiovascular endurance to improve the quality of their lives. And later he worked with astronauts to show how all of us can reverse muscle wasting. His two books, which are you know really two of my favorites, I keep them close to me on my, the shelves, are Astrofit, which was the astronaut program for anti-aging. And the other one was something that I first learned about Dr. Evans was called Biomarkers. And this was actually in 1994 when I was at a conference with Dr. Dean Ornish. And uh, one of the speakers there was George Leonard, who was a very interesting guy, a martial arts expert and journalist and writer. And he said it was one of the best books that he had ever read, read, uh, read on staying healthy. So back then I got a copy. So with all of that intro, I'd like to welcome Dr. William Evans to the podcast. Thank you. It's, it's really great. And, and I really appreciate um, your introduction and the way you kind of framed it. Because um, too often there, there is a whole host of people and researchers that are interested in anti-aging. And, and by that, what I mean is that they're interested in, in, is there a way to extend how long you're going to live? Right. And, you know, there's some interesting research along those lines, right. but really the practice of geriatric medicine, as you said, is trying to keep people functional, trying to right. keep people independent, you know, and, and the way you framed it up is, is actually perfect because that really is what, um, what, we're, what our whole goal is. And, and, you know, when you start talking to very old people, you know, th their interest really isn't to live to be 120 or 130. They just don't want to go to a nursing home. They exactly. just, they really, exactly. you know, their interest is just being at home and being independent. Exactly. That's such a great point. Uh, you know, it brings to my mind, you know, and uh, sometimes we may get into this too, what role genetics plays in this, but it's funny. I'll never forget my, my wife's grandfather on her uh, paternal side. He lived to 102, 103, and he was extraordinarily vital. I mean, he had ramrod straight posture. He, uh, he played golf a couple times a week, mentally super sharp. It was, it was the kind of thing you dreamed about. And he lived a super high quality life until his you know, last few months when he did get sick and had kidney failure and, and he passed away. But it, he was like a testament to what I think we all would love to have. And unfortunately, we sometimes see, as you know, and you know, in your work, we see people in their 70s or 80s start to really deteriorate quickly and almost like before they really want to. And what can we do about it? And I think your books address that. So the first thing I'm going to go to, because we're going to kind of jump back and forth between your books, because I think some of it overlaps and 
in, in good ways uh, to the 10 biomarkers that you point out in your book, Biomarkers. And I'll kind of go through the list and you know, we'll touch on a few things, a few things I may not go into depth about because I think they're more metabolic and I think they're important, but I wanted to get to especially the physical aspect. So sure. let's, I want to understand first about muscle mass again. Can you remind me again what we mean by that? And you know, the different aspects of muscle strength. And again, what you address immediately in, um, in your books is sarcopenia. Yeah, you know, because well, most people know about osteoporosis and osteopenia, but they don't understand. Exactly. Well, it's, it's very interesting. And in fact, our, our very latest research uh, it brings this all back home. So I was the first to describe this condition we call sarcopenia, which, mm. which as I described it, is the age-related loss of muscle mass. And it was my idea that muscle, the loss of muscle mass would predict some distal outcome like risk of disability or risk of falling down or mortality even, just as osteopenia, which is the loss of bone density, is highly predictive of a fracture. Right. Now in the intervening years, there have been a lot of research using what I think are inaccurate measurements of muscle. They use, they measure lean mass and so the, the, the field has, has evolved such that lean mass is not that predictive of outcomes. And so there has been this um, idea that perhaps muscle isn't so important. And I and my colleagues now have invented a, a new method to measure how much muscle is in your body. How is that? How do you do that? With a very simple test. And really? We've now published about eight or nine papers on how important muscle mass is and, and i'll just describe it very briefly yeah i'm, I'm interested I, i've never i don't know if i've ever heard of this before. It, it, no it, it's it's new and in fact we're just i've got five nih grants now to use this method in various populations oh, and we're oh. about to introduce it into the framingham study. Oh, wow see so everybody sit in your chair and get get ready for the breakthrough information i love having yeah. this go ahead <laughs> yeah so um you probably heard of creatine. Yes. Mm -hmm. So 98% of all the creatine in your body is in muscle. Oh, interesting, right? And, and um, you, the muscles don't have any capability of synthesizing or making creatine. It's all made in the kidney and liver. And then it's actively transported into muscle. And creatine serves an important purpose in muscle. Um, uh, so our idea was that if we could measure the total amount of creatine in your body, we would have a beautiful method to measure muscle mass. And so the way that we do it is we use what's called a stable isotope label. It's a deuterium label that we put on a creatine molecule. Mm -hmm. Subject swallows it. It gets transported to all muscles in the body. Mm -hmm. And then the beauty of creatine is that it's converted into creatinine, which is lost in urine. So after we give subjects this little capsule of deuterated creatine, we simply take a, a, a urine sample, just a spot urine sample. And we look at how much of the creatinine has this deuterium label on it. And it tells us exactly how much muscle you have. Well, that is fascinating. No, no wonder I haven't heard of this. Now, what I wanted to just take back to the listeners to tell them practicality, you know, it's interesting getting my medical training and still to this day, you know, I typically order blood chemistries and it's interesting because creatinine is again, something I tend to only focus on with the kidney. Right. You know, when I look at a patient's BUN, blood urea, nitrogen, or creatinine, I'm looking to see, you know, is, are they having any type of what we call renal insufficiency or the kidneys are not working properly. But I do remember being warned in my medical training that w both ways, when someone has a huge muscle mass, you know, like body right. builders, yeah. stuff like that too, that could be artificially low or, or, or just elevated. And yeah. the same for people, unfortunately, that might've been in the hospital for weeks or months exactly. for wasting away. Exactly. So 
but so, your test, as, as amazing as it sounds, does sound a little bit complex. It sounds like, again, a little more of a research test. Do you think uh, this will ever get to the, in a way that we can use, you know, in our, in our ab- offices? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, you just, for, you know, for the, for the practitioner, um, it, it's almost like an oral glucose tolerance test, if you think about it. Okay. Patient, patient swallows a pill and produces a sample. That's, okay. That's oh, all. okay. All right. So they would swallow the pill and then produce the urine sample, and that would give you. And then an send idea. it off. You send the urine sample off for analysis. And we, okay. You know, and what we're going to get to later in the lecture, because I don't like to keep people hanging, but yeah. that you know we're going to do something about this because that's that's the other whole key. I be- always believe yeah. in medicine too. I don't like just testing. I mean, it's great for research, but if you can do something about it. That's even more well, important. I think importantly, and, and this is maybe the, the take home message, we, we just finished a series of studies in a very large cohort of old people, you know, and, and, um, and what we were able to show is muscle mass is highly related to a risk of disability. Mm. It's highly related even to cognitive function. Mm. It's highly related uh, to mortality among wow. older people, wow. it's more predictive of a fracture than bone density. Wow, so, I believe that, and I think that's so important. And and again, just to bring a little bit of correlation to the listeners too, you know, again in my clinical practice, I practiced thirty years, and besides being a practicing doctor, which I enjoy doing in immunology and holistic medicine. I'm sort of a student of medicine and I'm a student of people. And what I've noticed over my career, and I, t- I tell the patients these stories, why it's so important to be physically active, that I, I used to really see, you know, that patients that had very physically active jobs, like one patient, I'll never forget, once he came in, he must have been 83 years old. And he just had very, you could tell, you know, his muscle structure was very, very good. And so, you know, I'm taking care of him for whatever, you know, condition he came in, but I asked him, what was your, what's your job? You know, he had stopped working, but he used to work for the telephone company. He used to climb up the poles to (laughs) fix the, you know, the wires and, you know, uh, obviously not the easiest job in the world, but clearly having done being physically active like that for, you know, many years, he, he was in very good shape. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the very first studies that ever showed that was in, um, is in London. And a famous investigator looked at the, the, the men who escorted people up and down the two-decker stairs mm. versus the drivers. Mm-hmm. And they found that the guys that were walking all the time, they lived significantly longer yeah. than drivers. And so, you know, again, it's an early example that physical activity, however you measure it, even it's super poor, job, which is so hard in this day and age to do now where everybody is on a computer for hours at a time. So, yeah. Yeah. okay. So I, I think we covered that and I want to move on, but cause sure. then we're going to get into some really interesting questions about like how you increase your muscle mass, whether it's through yeah. cardio or weightlifting as you talk about in your books. But so what's the difference between muscle mass as one of the biomarkers and muscle strength? I mean, you think if somebody has a lot of muscle mass, well, isn't no. that just assumed they're, they're strong, they have a lot of muscle strength or no? Well, I mean, there is a relationship between strength and, and muscle mass, but there are a number of different components of strength. Okay. And so um, we know that if you have to lay in bed for a, a while, you get weak and you get weak pretty fast. And much of that has to do with how the brain can recruit muscles to generate force. So when, when we do our, our strength training programs, and I know we'll talk a little bit about that or a lot. Yeah, we will. We're going to get into that. Sure. um, We see an immediate increase in strength. I mean, so fast that it's not accounted for by an increase in muscle. Interesting. And what that really is, is Mm. that the brain, the motor cortex learns how to recruit more muscle cells. Wow. And it does okay. that, you know, it, within um, three or four days. Wow. You're answering a question I had earlier on too, like well, why we lose our muscle mass so fast. You know, one of the biggest fears I think for, you know, patients and, you know, obviously honestly, even doctors and healthcare workers in this COVID, that like, God forbid you get sick, God forbid you're intubated. You know, we know that when you're laying there in a bed for a couple of weeks at a time, I mean, your muscle mass just 
dissipates. Yeah. Yeah. And then you see, you know, you hear the stories, God, thank God the person recovered miraculously, right? But they're walking with a cane and a wheelchair. I mean, this is weeks, months of uh, rehabilitation and recovery. Yeah. So you're saying that again, the, you know, it's, I never thought of it this way. So that the brain is the key part, uh, at least a key component of muscle strength. And it makes me think, are you telling me Dr. Evans too, that if God forbid somebody was had an injury or something, they're laying in bed for months and they really can't move the muscle or something either through electrical stimulation or trying to almost even imagine like you're tensing the muscle. Can that help? Yes. There, there are data that would, would tell us that, um, that even doing bedside um, activities and strength training mm -hmm. will, will, will have some some effect. Okay. And and you're right that you know we did a, a, a study funded by the National Institutes of Health. What we were interested in in how do old people respond to bed rest? We put uh, healthy old people to bed for ten days, mm. and and found that in just ten days they lose more than a kilogram of muscle just from their legs. Wow. And that's three mm -hmm. times as much as we see with young people. You know, I have to, you know, every time you bring up something really interesting, I sometimes have to bring up these clinical things for patients. And um, the thing I wanted to say was that back in the day too, you know, I remember my, the, the cardiology doctors that used to teach me, they go, you know, and this was in the late 1980s uh, when I did my residency training, they, you know, they, uh, they said, you know, back in the day when they trained, a person would have a heart attack and, and they were on strict bed rest for, right. for 10 days, two weeks. And they would typically sometimes have a second heart attack because right. obviously they weren't moving around. And the other story, which makes, you know, I thought I'd bring up at some point, but I want to bring it up here, was there was a very famous orthopedic surgeon at Harvard. I think Dr. Uh, wait, was the ortho Yeah, I think he was an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Dudley White. Yes. And when he used to make bedside rounds, you know, and this was like really like in the fifties, I think he took care of doc, uh, president uh, Eisenhower. But when he used to make bedside rounds and he had to decide on a surgical candidate, he'd be, you know, surrounded by his like 10 residents following him around. And, you know, they'd be assessing whether this patient was, you know, um, stable enough to go to surgery. And the thing that he would do is he would pull the covers off of the, off of their, you know, their body and look at their legs if their legs look strong, he said, okay, they're going to make it through the operation. He didn't need an echocardiogram or something to determine, you know, their, uh, you know, their heart function. Sure. And, and as you know, the early um, cardiac rehabilitation was very controversial. That mm -hmm. is taking someone who's just had a heart attack and then putting them through a rigorous exercise program was thought to be you know, potentially very dangerous. And, right. and, and the, the father of cardiac rehabilitation, uh, his name was Herman Hellerstein, who's the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, he was also one of Eisenhower's physicians and, and uh, tried to get him up and moving around. Interesting. And we now wow. know it, it is fundamental to, yeah. to how to do that. cardiac patients can function. Okay. So you're saying again, too, so that the muscle strength, and, and we're going to get into how you increase that, and I assume muscle mass, but it's, it's, it's really more a combination of the brain muscle connection. Yeah. The strength, yeah. Strength has many components. And I mean, can you be, can you have a small muscle mass and be strong still? I mean, is that, or, well, or like, for example, if you're a, I mean, I can give you an example, if you're a weightlifter or somebody, but you're 130 pounds, but you can lift a lot for your weight, you know, but you don't have a big muscle mass because a guy that's 240 pounds you know, might have a lot of muscle mass and maybe he lifts the same or a little bit more than you. Is that, is that like- Well, a, there, a there probably are, are a couple of different components to muscle strength. So when we do our strength training programs, mm -hmm. um, in the initial month and a half, most of the gains in strength are due to how the brain learns to recruit these, these mm. units, the muscle cells. Okay. That, that plateaus after a okay. while. And then the only way to get stronger- is to get bigger muscles. And again, we can see that in our studies in older people, they, they, they continue to get stronger throughout the year, but in the first month or two, they get strong very, very rapidly. And that's due to this kind of brain uh, recruitment of, of, of muscle fiber. Well, you know, let's, let's talk about this now, the two, because I mean, it, it, it probably makes sense. So like, I, again, I remember reading in your work and stuff like that too. So you were having these people you know, lift weights, you know, you know, you see, let's say you see an 80 year old person in a nursing home and they look very weak and frail 
and you guys start coming in saying, okay, let's start lifting what two pound weights, three pound weights, four pound weights. They were lifting at 80% of their maximal capacity. That's the thing that we did that was really new that no mm-hmm. one else had, had done before. Right. Is we use what's called high intensity strength training or resistance training. Okay. And, and we knew that from, from what young people had done and, and what the research had shown is that in order to get stronger, you have to lift a weight that um, tires you out after only about eight or 10 lifts. That is, if you can lift a weight 20 times or 30 times, it's not going to make you stronger. Well, I want to ask you this. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt because, you know, I, and I've pursued this through my career, even on myself, and I've got injured so many times and I tend to always go even with light weights. It's like if you go too rapidly or you lift something too heavy, don't, you know, you tear sometimes the tendons and not necessarily the, mu- I mean, the muscle might get strong, but the tendon has to hold that muscle. How do you, how do you avoid the injuries in these people that are kind of frail to begin with? Or Well, well remember, um, the muscle is about as strong as the tendon. So in a frail person, as you said, you know, our, our oldest in our studies was 98 years old. Right. Um, you know, lifting at 80% of their one repetition maximum of their le- maximum lifting capacity, that might be eight pounds or nine pounds. And, 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 um, and, and that is not going to tear or rip their tendons. Okay. And the nature of what we did, also very important, was that it's progressive. As I said, you know, the brain starts to learn to recruit motor units um, mm. um, rapidly. Okay. So every week we would remeasure how strong they were and have them lift heavier weights. And, and uh, in- what was the, what did you see? Like, was there any traumatic cases that you remember? Like where there was a guy just, or a woman just like sitting in a chair looking, honestly, unfortunately hopeless. And you guys start on the program and then all of a sudden they're, lifting things or, you know, getting out of their chair a lot better. I mean, did you see some yeah, of those dramatic I, things? Yeah, I'll t- I'll t- one interesting story, I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah, we, a, we like stories. Su- <laughs> yeah, in a subsequent study. So we were doing a, um, a study, um, in this case, it was in patients with renal failure and they were very weak. And, and we had one guy that told us this story is that he lived in a rural area and um, his mailbox was about a hundred yards from his house. And he went out, got his mail, and then he fell down mm-hmm. and he couldn't get up. Yeah. Well, and you hear he, these stories, and right? He literally mm-hmm. couldn't get up and he was mm-hmm. down for hours mm-hmm. before somebody came and helped him up. Right. Now we had him um, strength training and his kids came to see him. And they just just came to my, I can't I'll never forget. They came to my office and they said, this is a miracle. I've never mm-hmm. seen it because their father was now going up and down stairs easily. They said, mm-hmm. we had no idea that this was possible. Wow. And, and so, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the applying kind of maybe logical um, kind of physiologic uh, ideas to older people, uh, you know, was new. And uh, it produces what are often kind of miraculous things. You know, in the nursing home, we had people that would tell us, you know, I no longer need to ring for a nurse in the middle of the night to use a toilet. Wow, that's huge. And, you know, I, huge. and I, I, I don't need my walker anymore. Or, yeah, you know, that's, so that's huge. Yeah, it's huge. It, it has an enormous um, uh, effect on the quality of life of those patients. Who did the work with those patients, by the way? Was it like physical therapists, your researchers? I mean, like, what was the training that these people had well, to have? That's, a, that's another story. We, okay. <laughs> we, and I don't want to disparage uh, physical therapists a, at all, but they have their own way of doing things. And right. They were different than, than what we wanted. Who's we? I mean, your, your team? My, like my, your, my, research, my research team. Your research team. Mm-hmm. We got a large grant from the National Institute on Aging to do this study. Mm-hmm. So we essentially hired a recreation therapist and, okay. and, and we said, this is what we want. This is how we want to have them tested. This is what they, we want them to do. Mm-hmm. And the therapists in the, this was in a place called the Hebrew Rehab Center for the Aged in the Boston area. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the therapists, they, they couldn't believe what we were doing. And, and uh, when the results came out, you know, we were, you know, we published in the New England Journal of Medicine and we were featured on the 
um, uh, CBS Evening News and, you know, and, and 2020 did a feature on what we did. And, and suddenly everybody got religion. Um, but, yeah, you have to it, break some eggs sometimes. <laughs> and it's, but it's good. I mean, it's good. I, you know, it's just that people have this view of aging. Yeah. As you say, that aging isn't for sissies. That's for sure. Yeah, and, oh, it's and, tough. And you, you have to, you know, anything that's worth having is sometimes... You got to uh, fight for it. You got to fight, right. Yeah, I tell my patients hard. a lot too, you know, like what, you, you know, because again, when we were in our 20s, maybe your 30s, you feel a little bit invincible. And, you know, you look at an older person, you're like, I just, you can't relate. And as you get into your, I think, 50s, 60s, little tweaks, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you start to think of it. And then as you get closer or you see your parents age, you start to get a little nervous and you say, oh, gosh, I, you know, I hope I could do a little better this way or that way. And, uh, and I think that's what your work does. Um, I'm going to move on to the next thing because I want to get through sure. so much stuff, but it, I think we're, we're covering a lot of key things. So let's talk about the basal metabolic rate. And sure. you mentioned in your books also how that goes down and that affects a lot of things. So can you explain that you know, to the sure. listeners? Yeah. So uh, when you're sitting here, when you're resting, we all burn calories and the amount of calories that you burn at rest is your basal metabolic rate. And we know that that goes down as you grow older. Mm -hmm. And what that, what that translates to is that you need less food to maintain your weight. If your metabolic rate is going down okay. and you're not that active, then you just need a lot fewer calories to maintain your weight. And many of us don't decrease our caloric intake because we're still hungry or we're just bored i mean what's the <laughs> well because it, is... because appetite doesn't necessarily follow this basal that doesn't decrease rate. either obviously <laughs> right and and so and and the and and the basal metabolic rate the the decline with aging is absolutely and totally a product of the loss of muscle Okay. That's, awesome. that's the key thing I know that right. you brought out in your books. Cause what I want to make the point to the listeners and, and probably nobody can explain it better than you is that, you know, people start to realize that they're like, I, and I get this all the time from patients. I know my own self. I'm like, gosh, why, how come I, you know, if I eat a little bit less, I'm not losing weight. How come if I exercise a little bit more, I don't lose weight. And, you know, I guess with the premises in your book, which uh, also, I don't know if you know them, the people out in, uh, I, I think they're very interesting. Uh, Jersey and Anela Gregoric. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they're body lifters and they've written some books on this subject. You're not research like you, but you know that it, it really comes down to your, your muscle mass and everything because, you know, we always think that, gosh, you know, by running, riding, swimming, we can increase our basal metabolic rate, but is that like fairly limited? Like you really need the muscle mass to? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's important. So maybe explain right. that a little so bit more. Swimming and running that it elevates your metabolic rate while you're doing the exercise itself. And that's right. Right. But you know, uh, 30 or 40 minutes after that, your, met your metabolic rate is back down to where it was. Muscle is what we call a very expensive tissue. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is muscle has these little, what are called sodium and potassium pumps in them that require a lot of energy to maintain muscle uh, as opposed to fat, which, okay. you know, we don't need much energy to, to support fat. Muscle is an extremely expensive tissue uh, and, and it's metabolically expensive. So um, the more muscle you have, the greater your metabolic rate. That's why men typically need to eat more calories than women because there are differences in metabolic uh -huh. that are totally a result of differences in the amount of muscle and we lose muscle as we grow older and that drives this metabolic rate down does does doing cardio i mean like a lot of times too what i find personally you know and you know we will also we all only have so much hours in the day to sure. sometimes exercise and do stuff and I'll give you an example too for myself. Like sometimes in the nice weather, I wish it was a little nicer now than it is here <laughs> in the cold Northeast. Um, you know, I would go for a bike ride first and then I try to lift some weights and do something too. But I would find that I was tired after I rode my bike for let's say 10 miles. And um, I don't know if somebody had a choice or should you not do things on the same day? Or is it, is, would you say that the lifting is the priority? I mean, you know, if, if, well, and again, if you had, if you have a half hour in your day, 
you know, to do something? What's, what's more important? You know, well, sometimes- that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. And we all have a limited amount of time that we're willing to spend for exercise, right. irrespective of how much time we may have in the day. Right. Um, but um, here's the thing. The primary deficit that occurs as we grow older is weakness. Right. And what we have found and other people have found is that weakness um, determines how physically active you are. Right. So, so one of the things that we've seen and we've done a couple of studies like this where all that we've done is strength training three days a week. Right. And what we found is that as weaker people become stronger, if we keep records of how much they do, they climb stairs more often. They mm-hmm. get up and move around more frequently. They, they are far more active as a result of being stronger. Now, this is in people that, that you know, may be somewhat weak already, older people. But to maintain your muscle mass, you don't have to do much. It's just two days a week, maybe. Okay, but what, I'm going to give you a sort of a specific example. Like, for example, I like bike riding. I just yeah. find it relaxing. I like I the nice too. weather. I love- and I, find, I know you, read, you mentioned your book, how you were in Arkansas. It was like 100 yeah. degrees and you wouldn't have yeah. a bike ride in the morning. I remember yeah. everything about your book. Yeah. But let's say I love bike riding because it's, it's beautiful out. You know, I don't want to be indoors, you know, in the beginning of the yeah. day, you know, to lift weights or something if I have time. I want to be out there riding. And I found that, let's say again, especially over the summer here, you know, in the Northeast, you know, that my legs got definitely got stronger. Now, how does that not correlate? Like, why would I have this, you know, instead of doing, let's say, some kind of leg lifts or something, why isn't, you know, and there are obviously cyclists who are in amazing condition who probably don't even lift weights because they can't handle the extra weight in their body, you know, because they're competitive. But, you know, and, and also there are people that, you know, I see out in the streets where I live, well, walkers. I mean, they get up in the morning. They like to go for a walk. It's re- it's mentally relaxing. Obviously, it must have benefit. You know, again, with their muscles and their, you know, and their uh, cardiac capacity. But are you saying don't shortchange the weightlifting for that? I mean, it's just too important. Well, I, you know, I because well, I know in your, I, actually in your book too, you did both. I mean, yeah. like I remember your routine. I was like studying it. You know, you would go for your I don't know ten mile bike ride, and then you were doing the uh, resistance stuff so yeah I, tell us. I, I was lucky because i have a, a lab where i worked so or yeah you have the built-in right, right. gym <laughs> i had the, built, the built-in gym you know um here's the thing cycling walking all those activities are fantastic they improve your cardiovascular function they increase your life expectancy they help you prevent diabetes and chronic disease but they don't prevent sarcopenia Okay. And, you know, there oh, are so they big- don't. So even let's say, uh, even let's say, you know, people who do, wa- you know, do water workouts, like, you know, with resistance, because it's not the same as weights, but it, you know, the, the, it's easier on their joints. I mean, the same sure. thing with biking, you know, again, as we get older, our, your joints hurt, you know, and, or you, you sure. know, and the great. resistance, the resistance exercise that people can do in the pool, because it is resistance exercise. Yeah, I like, I do it. I really um, love it. Um, um, can in fact strengthen your muscles. But as I said, if, if you can contract your muscles against a resistance mm-hmm. more than 20 or 30 times, which is what you do in cycling, sure, it's not going to increase you, the amount of muscle you have. So you just plateau. So it's just really doing cardio, but it also you're saying it doesn't give a lasting benefit on your basal metabolic rate. I mean, going back that's to your- correct. That's correct. Okay, correct. so that's really important. You know, because again, too, and the basal metabolic rate, as you said, is very important because if- as it goes down, we're just going to normally gain weight, right? Is that, that's, is that right. The, that's, the, that's the negative. That's pretty much it. You know, okay. if you need fewer calories and you don't decrease your calorie intake, mm. um, you know, that's, a good point. that's uh, why people you, gain weight. Mm-hmm. You're going to gain weight and you're going to gain fat. And yeah. uh, older people tend to gain more fat around their gut, their belly, the visceral fat, which sure. is. Um, uh, increases the risk of uh, disease. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, that's our next our next marker. We're going to get to body fat percentage, and um, you know there are there are all these tables, you know that you know that are based on height and and weight, right? I mean, you know, there's the BMI index kind of thing, and um, so tell us about that. Like, you know, again, I know I'm sure in the research lab you guys probably do the calipers and all that stuff too. But what what do you think is realistic? for, you know, you know, people in their sixties or seventies. I mean, again, they're not, I mean, as much as we don't like to be Olympic athletes, we're not, you know, we're <laughs> everyday uh, you know, people. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
body fatness is a is one of those that um, it, it's hard to it's harder to measure. It's like muscle mass; it's hard to measure. So body. So body I'm sorry. Can we stop for one second, Samantha? Yeah, I was just gonna say. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. It just have, dropped. I, I don't know. Yeah, your your thing dropped a little bit. I just want to make sure we can hear it really good. The internet kind of dropped for a second, so oh, I thought that it what might it have been a bandwidth thing. But oh, could you? Okay, can you repeat what you were saying again to uh, Dr. Evans about yeah. how? Um, sure. So body fat. It's still kind of um, low. I'm sorry. Um, can you? Did the microphone perhaps come out? Yeah, or? but that's what that's what it sounds like to me. Like it kind yeah. of. Yeah. To unplug and replug. Yeah, why don't we try yeah. that really quick? Okay. It might be a glitch. Yeah, that sounds so it's definitely in, yeah. How about now? Let me sit here. Okay. That's much oh. better. Yeah, it's loud. <laughs> oh, one sec. Do you mind just counting really quick, Dr. Evans? One, two, three, four, five. Six, we back could, seven, eight, yeah, nine, could ten. do you mind um could you uh, just like hold the where the, the little microphone is on the wire? Like yes. let's just just test it. You mind talking again? Hello? Five, four, three, two, one. That's better, right? Yeah. yeah, but so do we want to just maybe if you, uh, so your hands on in the shot, um, maybe just hold it kind of like at that level, but down lower like, on the wire. Like that? Mm. Okay. What do you think, uh, Dr. I just don't want to stress it. Yeah, I don't right want you to thing. be uncomfortable. That's the yeah. thing, yeah. So why don't no, you- No, no, that's fine. Because that's good. I can, now I'm hearing you much better, so. Is, okay, if that's okay with you, Dr. All right. Mitchell, we'll, yeah, if he doesn't mind. Okay, that'd be super. Thank you so All right, much. So we, we're talking about the body fat and uh, you were saying what would be yeah, realistic so, for people in their 60s or 70s? I mean, what, you know, what, what should they really be so, trying to eat? Right. So, you know, so obesity is defined by body mass index, which is weight over height squared. Mm -hmm. It's not a measurement of percent body fat, but it's okay. One of the things we do know, and this is an interesting one that has been controversial in the past, but Older people um, that gain a little bit of weight uh, live longer. Right. So that's right. That recently came out. That was the, that's the good news, everybody. <laughs> yeah. So for so for example, an ideal body mass index for someone in their twenties and thirties might be twenty five, mm -hmm. twenty four, or twenty five. Mm -hmm. For an older person, ideal body mass index is twenty seven. So it's a significant increase. Okay. And there are maybe a lot of reasons for that that we won't have to go into. But one of the things we, we also know is that older people that are fat, that have a B body mass index, maybe above 30 or 31, their body fat is hard to move around. And so it, it, it maybe imparts some degree of risk for disease, but it's hard to move around. You know, it's hard to get up. And so yeah, we find yeah. that many other people that are overweight, um, you know, they become less active just mm. because it's not so easy to move around. So weight loss for older people is hard because their metabolic rate is lower and their need for calories is lower. It's hard, but maybe even a small change in body weight might be of some You know, it's benefit. interesting you say that too, because I've got where I was reading this, but they were saying something like also like, I think for every like five or 10 pounds, it's an, I think it's an extra 70 times pressure on your knees. Uh, yeah. I think it was right. So it's like, again, cause you think, oh, I gained another five, 10 pounds. I mean, whatever, it's not such a big deal, but 70 times more pressure on your knees as you get older. I mean, yeah, you're not gonna wanna get out of your chair. I mean, yeah. And, uh, and in fact, one of the things that orthopedic surgeons often ask their patients to do before they succumb to the surgery is to try to lose weight. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes you eliminate the need for surgery because now it's a lot easier to move around. So, so weight, body fatness is, is a tough one. And it's tough because uh, older people uh, or all of us have a hard time losing weight, but it's particularly older, uh, harder for people over the age of 60. So would you say again, just to tie in a bunch of things we've been talking about up till now, but if again, if you were going to really make, you know, again, and you know, the, this Jersey Gregory makes a big case about this, but I, again, I, I trust a lot of your research and work. If, if you had a little bit more time, would you head toward the weights or would you get on your bike or, you know, make sure you went for your jog or your, your long walk if you're trying to get that body fat percentage down? Yeah, probably the weightlifting is, okay. is the better way to do it right. because, and, and because of two things. One is that it increases your metabolic rate. Okay. And number two, 
we find that people that get stronger tend to become more active anyway. Okay. Um, right. and, and so that's, so that's the key. I mean, I think, I think that's the really the take home message, you know, I mean, as I said, for anybody listening here being wanting to be more vital and, and as we age and, and if they're struggling with the weight thing, I mean, it's something to really remember that the weight training obviously done properly could be really important. Uh, I want to move on to aerobic capacity too, because sure. that was again one of your biomarkers. And I want to ask you, um, I mean, again, I want to know your definition of it, but I also, what comes to my mind is I, you know, there are things that people like doing. I mean, like some people love running, so they run five miles. I like to play tennis. I was a tennis player in college and I started playing back again now after many years when I, you know, healed up after some surgeries. And, um, and I know it's interesting because it, it has also to do with fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers, you know, certain kind of quick sports. So tell us about aerobic capacity, what's important, what activities help that. Sure. Uh, so aerobic act, uh, um, capacity is the maximal capacity to use oxygen. Obviously, extremely well-trained athletes have the highest aerobic capacity. The highest I've ever measured was an athlete by the name of Steve Prefontaine. Who oh, yeah. Was, oh, yeah. He was the incredible miler, right, from uh, Oregon. Well, he was, yeah, he was the, and the, and the middle distance runner. Middle distance, right. right. I'm and sorry, middle, yeah. he had a, a aerobic capacity that was in like 84, 85 milliliters of oxygen. For well, is that some of that genetic? I mean, I'm sure it is, right? There's got to be some. It's, it's, it. It is partially genetic because he was higher than like Frank Shorter, who we had measured, who was the wow. premier marathon runner. Right, of course. Uh, yeah. You know, he was an incredible. So part of it is genetic. But um, so, and it, it goes up, you know, as for people that do a lot of aerobic activity, I mean, that's the way you, you, you train the heart to increase its cardiac output. Uh, muscle itself becomes more oxidative. And by that, it means, I mean, it, it uses... Um, oxygen far more efficiently. And so all of those things are good. And, and aerobic capacity is also associated with decreased risk of disease. Um, so, uh, you know, the way that I look at physical activity and exercise, if I tell you, um, Dean, yeah. that you shouldn't be doing that tennis or, or biking, but rather swimming, yeah. Um, and you, yeah, well, okay. But, you know, I'm, and terrible. Two, I'm a terrible swimmer. So after that's a week I, or two, you'll say, hi, this is, hi, this sucks. I don't want to do that. Right. So whatever it is that you really enjoy doing, that's what you need to do because that's the thing that you're going to carry with you through the rest of your life. And strength training is one of those things that often people don't think about so much. And you don't have to do it very much. That's the important thing. Unlike right. aerobic capacity, if you want to increase your aerobic capacity, you have to do aerobic exercise almost every day. Well, that's like the cyclists too. They tend to yeah. have like amazing, you know, those VO2 yeah. max yeah. things and, yeah. and how much lactic acid they can tolerate the right. buildup. But I almost want to bring that to the point of about the sweating. You know, yeah. there's a lot of activities we can do you know, that, you know, are fun. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure people golf, which is it's good to be out in fresh air and stuff like that too, but you're not sweating. And does that have to do with like in reaching that aerobic capacity? I mean, like, should you be breaking a sweat? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. And, and I golf every weekend. So, <laughs> and I walk okay. 18 holes, which is right. about That's nine good. miles. That's fun. And I carry my bag and I sweat. <laughs> oh, you sweat carrying the bag, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, but, but yeah, I, and I remember one time uh, we had a subject who we were measuring their body fatness and she was talking about, you know, uh, something must be wrong with me because when I exercise, I never sweat. Yeah. And I thought, just as you were saying, well, you're, you're not really exercising, you know, uh -huh. uh, because you're right. Exercise has to be a sufficient intensity. Well, should you even be sweating when you wait, when you do weights? I mean, you know, it's interesting. Well, you don't have to No, Cause um, that's that, that's not, I mean, unless you do them, unless you do them without too much rest in between sets right, and all right. that stuff like yeah. that. Because our, our, uh, the, the, the exercise that we have people doing is usually like three sets of eight repetitions. So they'll lift a weight eight times. Yeah. Then they'll rest then they'll lift eight times, and then they'll rest, and then they'll lift eight times again. And, and that doesn't necessarily break a sweat. Sometimes right. it does. Yeah, and I know when I do that, I, I don't even feel anything. It's just well, I want to get to after. I get so sore two days later. I can, yeah. sometimes, I'm like, what the hell happened? You know? And yeah. 
you know, well, I want to get that to muscle soreness is an indicator that your body is adapting to the exercise for sure. That's good or bad. That's good. That's really, really? good. Oh God. It's painful. Sometimes I'm like, what the heck did I want to pick something else? Well, you know, when you got to do your regular stuff. So, okay. Uh, but, and what about this whole thing about the fast twitch, slow twitch? Cause again, I was reading from different things like, you know, people, you know, again, I love telling stories. Like, you know, I, I, I was always a big fan of sports illustrated. I used to love that magazine yeah. <laughs> and they always had very interesting articles. And one time they had an article on this Austrian American citizen. He had lived, you know, his early life in, in Austria. And, you know, in Austria, I guess their big activity is skiing, you know. So he used to walk up the mountain and ski down, you know, it was wonderful. And he came to the United States. And I think he ended up moving to Hawaii in the story. And he was a mailman, you know, and his whole time he was pretty active, but he wasn't in great straight shape. And he was small and he ended up being, becoming very weak, you know. And I don't know why, but in the story they talk about, I guess, because he won a medals, he started entering um, sprinting competitions. He ended up being the record holder for like the 90 year olds and the 100 year olds on sprinting. And I mean, the time was, you know, some 20 year olds could walk a little bit faster than he did it. But, you know, I give him a lot of credit. I mean, here he was in races, national races at 90 and 100 years old. Right. And he actually said he had to do a little bit of weightlifting to get, you know, to get himself stronger. So my question is, you know, again, also, if I have a little time, I mean, is like in the tennis or like doing a little kind of sprints more beneficial than going for a two mile jog? Well, it depends on what your goal is. It, it all depends on what your goal is. It, you know, if your goal is to, goal be is to feel good, have fun and uh, stay healthy. Then, then, you know, the sprinting, you don't have to do the sprinting if you don't want. Well, to. I mean, I, I think it's fun if you, I mean, is it, but is there a value to that? I mean, because again, you're it, trying to, because they yeah. say you can't change your fast twitch and, and slow twitch, no, right? I mean, is that... no, no, you can't, but, but here's the thing. You can't or you can? You cannot. Oh, um, okay. there is there is an age related loss in the type two or fast switch fibers. Yeah, they tend to go down and right. It makes sense, you know, to maintain your s slow fibers, because those are the ones you use all day long. Right. And you don't recruit. We don't use our fast switch fibers very much. And so if you do that sprinting sort of exercise, you're going to recruit those fast switch fibers and help to maintain their, their strength. So that's a good thing, though, that's I would think. That's a good thing, and that's yeah. what weightlifting does. It also okay. recruits those fast switch fibers yeah. and helps um, to maintain them. So, yeah. So, yeah, I have a, a great story. I, I was privileged one, one night to have dinner with Sir Roger Bannister. Oh, wow. I would like I to have been there. <laughs> and I don't know the story of Roger Bannister, you know, for your readers, he, he, Sports Illustrated called it the most important sporting event of the 20th century. Wow. It was breaking the four minute mile. Yeah, it's breaking the four minute mile. Yeah, after he had uh, done a, he was like working at the hospital. He kind of came yeah. over after yeah. and. He was, uh, a, he was a, he was a, he was a physician. Medical student. And, yeah. And, uh -huh. and he didn't have time. Right. To do the kind of long distance training. Right. And he had heard about this new type of training in Sweden, uh, high intensity interval training. Oh, HIT, right? That's what, now it's called HIT. Yeah. It's all we famous, that, right? But, but it was called fartlek training in Sweden. Okay. And he started doing it and he was able to push his aerobic capacity up rapidly rather than having to do this long flow distance training and, mm. and uh, was able to break the four minute mile. And it was funny, he said, he used to send a medal to anybody else who would break the four minute mile after him. And he said, until high school students started doing it, <laughs> do it anymore. Wow. Fascinating. That is interesting. Um, okay. You know, I want to move on. I know there's a couple of the markers, but I, I don't even want to get into them here about the blood sugar tolerance, cholesterol, blood pressure. These are things that we do know about and sure. you know, people realize they're important and obviously bone density, you mentioned, I mean, people are so, concerned about it, but I, I thought it was so important in your work and your books you know, about how the sarcopenia is, can really be the, the, the more deadlier thing. But I want to ask you one last thing on the, on the biomarkers before I go into some other issues. The ability to regulate your internal body temperature. Why is this important? And how, how do you know whether you're not regulating your body temperature correctly? Well, one of the things we know is that when a heat wave moves through a big city, it's the old people that die. Oh, that's a good point. And, and, yeah. and there are a couple of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. One is, is that uh, with advancing age, we don't get as thirsty. Um, right. There's something called eclipsia. In the right. Mm -hmm. Secondly, old people don't have as much blood volume. Thirdly, 
old people don't sweat as much as young people do. When it's Does that have to do with hormonal regulation, like with, with ADDH or something? Well, or? It, 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 it has to do with a, with a number of things. One is that there's just not, there's not as many sweat glands as with okay. old people. There's sweat glands. Oh, interesting. And, um, and, and, and so all of those things combine to, to, to mean that an older person, you know, when exposed to extreme heat, they can suffer heat exhaustion and heat stroke. But the, the most important thing is, 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 is their thirst. Even when older people become dehydrated, they often don't get thirsty. And that's kind of- So how do you improve that? Or just, you should just, or should you just more consciously hydrate? You know, yeah, because I, I see this with younger patients. Yeah, you know, yeah. I have people that come into my office in their twenties and thirties, they're carrying around this giant, yeah. you know, liter water. And I'm like, I'm not so sure you need that all day long. Yeah. But then an older person, you know, like you're that's saying, just is not very cognizant of how important right. it is to. That's right. You know, especially in, in retirement communities and in nursing homes, it's a big problem. They have to force fluids. We, we, you know, it, old people just don't get as thirsty. Well, maybe they, so, also, they could get bloated, their stomach, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I think it's, it's, some it's, it's not that so much. I think many, it, it's just that there's a, a decreased desire to drink water. I mean, it's just a drink. It's, it's, right. it's, so it you, is, okay, so that's a really important point, though. So you're just saying, though, I mean, anyone who has a relative in a nursing home, I mean, obviously older people, I mean, I'm sure I'm thinking of my parents, too. You know, because also, unfortunately, too, they associate drinking more with going to the bathroom more. That's right. Well, that's you know, part, right? Of, part of the problem. Part of the problem. That's that's another issue is that many for, for women in particular is um, um, urinary incontinence is, is a is yeah, so they enormous they kind and of unrecognized problem for older well, people. Well, because you know what is also, you never know where you are. You know, I mean, you're where you're yeah. going to be. If you're not near to a bathroom, especially a bathroom you're, cl you're comfortable with, yeah. that becomes an issue. Yeah, yeah. so so, so, so the t ability to regulate body temperature, both in the heat and the cold, is, is impaired with aging. Yeah. And, and for, for the heat, you know, it, it's, it's drinking. And of course, exercise itself does what we call it, it expands the blood volume so you get greater blood volume so you can lose more fluid without compromising the cardiovascular system yeah oh, that's really interesting uh, i want to move on to a couple of things with the assessing the, the markers and one of the things that always also struck me too very interesting is like i guess you have in i think it's the biomarkers book about the one mile walk test and I yeah. used to think like, oh, like, what is this? You know? And then I realized, like, again, I've, I've got the amounts, but if you can't walk a mile, like in 10 or 12 minutes, you got a problem. And I realized that because, you know, when, unfortunately, when you're seeing older people with canes and this and that too, the fact that they're, they have some type of limitation, they obviously couldn't walk a mile in 10 minutes, 12 minutes. And that's a, a bad, yeah. you know, a bad sign. Well, what, you know, since since we published that, we, we there are a number of studies now that show that just your habitual walking speed, just the, the walking speed that you choose to walk at, not how fast you can walk, but your habitual walking speed is a powerful predictor of mortality. Wow. And, and uh, it, it's really quite astonishing. Wow. And we've shown that that's related to aerobic capacity. Right. So that as you lose this aerobic capacity, just getting up and moving around becomes a higher and higher percentage of your max. And we, we showed that in, in people that walk very slowly, um, even at 0.8 meters per second, they're walking at 90% of their aerobic capacity. That's what world-class marathon runners are running at the end of the race. Mm. So they become exhausted. So they choose not to walk and they become more exhausted still. So you're right. Walking ability is, is a big deal. And, and in fact, uh, for many geriatricians, they think that that's a, that's a vital sign, maybe more important than blood pressure in predicting mm. um, a risk. Okay. Uh, just to go back to ask you again too, because I know we're, we're kind, of, kind of nearing the end and I, uh, you have another engagement, but I would just have so many interesting questions to ask you. Um, about the injuries, and, and, and is there, have, have you come across anything about how to decrease getting injured? Even though, I mean, again, if you do proper technique, you know, again, a lot of us too, you know, every, you know, unfortunately injuries always hit at your weak point. If, you know, sometimes you could be lifting, I know myself too, I could be lifting my arms, my shoulder, and also my neck tightens up, you know, and maybe again, it has to do with other factors. But uh, that and that the delayed onset, you know, pain, which, you know, soreness, which uh, tends to make, you know, 
inhibit people a little bit? Are you saying we just have to live with that? I mean, well, just realize the, the, that's a good thing or? Sure. Well, the delayed on, if, you, if you're doing, if you're starting an exercise program, the delayed onset soreness is a result of some microscopic damage Tears, that yeah. you do to your muscle. It repairs right. and gets stronger. Right. And if you keep doing that exercises, you don't get uh, sore anymore. But the, the orthopedic ones, those are the tougher ones. And, and you're right. Some people, you know, do everything right. And, and then they get tennis elbow or they yeah, get right. They, they're like, I can't lift this. Right. You know, they, and, whatever and, they and tweak the, yeah, right. And, mm -hmm. and, I mean, and it, I, I, I think it's hard and we try to tell people that's fine. Let it rest. Um, when you exercise, it shouldn't hurt. Right. And so if it hurts, don't do it. Just exercise the other joints that, you know, that you can okay. move to a different activity, but you're right. The orthopedic ones take a while. And, and should they, should you, you know, again, if you're lifting not such heavy weights, can you do it every day? Should you always take a day or two rest? Yeah. If you're doing weightlifting to get stronger, yes. again, this is the, the, if that's the goal, right. Then you should do it probably no more than three days a week. Cause you want that recovery of the muscles. You I mean, want the recovery. the recovery. Even if it's light important. in the beginning, whatever too, just, yeah. you know, there's no yeah. point, you know, get right. into the rhythm, get into right. the, get the brain activity right. going. Exactly. Do okay. your, your other activities are important, but the weightlifting, you don't need to do it more than three days a week. And if mm -hmm. you start doing it more then you become a little obsessed <laughs> mm -hmm. and you might get some overuse injuries. Let me ask you too, as we wind you down a little too, again, I, I might've mentioned this already, but just again, cardio, before weights, weights before cardio, does it matter? Well, um, if you had to choose cardio before weights, because what cardio warms you up. does, it warms up your body, makes okay. your joints a little more flexible. Right. That's what I feel. I feel like I'm just prone, a little more energetic. Right. You're less prone to injury. All of okay. those things are good. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's a good thing. And what about also to, you know, again, our society is so uh, obsessed with, you know, the, the six pack, I don't know, the two pack, yeah. Yeah. I'd be just glad to have a flat abs, you know, um, how important is the core? You know, is it, you know, is it, cause you know, again, you look at, I, I've had a lot of people that I, you know, I respect saying, you know, sit-ups aren't the best thing for you. It can hurt your back. A lot of now they're talking about doing the planks and, and I, I would assume a lot of other activities you're, you're using your core. Like I know like when I serve in tennis, you know, again, you know, you're using your core. Yeah. How important is that, think, you know, versus uh, other muscles, like your leg muscles? Sure. The leg muscles maybe are the most important because they're associated with mo your mobility. Okay. Obviously, but, but core is also important because it helps keep you erect. It's kind of the way you move around through the world. And so there are some, you know, lower intensity core exercises you can do. Sit-ups probably aren't the best. But uh, lying on your stomach and trying to extend your back, that's that's oh yeah, like the, the cobra, right? You have that in your the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so I'm I know that you're gonna have to run and this was a tremendous this was a huge, you know, privilege and honor for me because they said I've been a fan of yours since nineteen ninety four or five. Uh, and I strongly recommend any of the listeners to get his books. They're still available. I've gotten them on Amazon. Astrofit, I I keep in my office, I show patients because I think the way you diagram the the whole routine the exercises how to do them properly and safely i think pretty much anybody can follow and i'm sure if they were with a physical therapist or a trainer you know they could achieve to do this and the benefits are beyond important so Th dr thank william you. evans i want to thank you well this has been a great discussion anytime Dean. all right I, ho I hope again too maybe we'll come back to finish up some more and uh please uh keep me informed on your work because i am you know i'm a fan and a participant <laughs> okay great. all right take care of yourself thanks, thanks.